Hello, in this video we'll continue with our corporate formation discussion. This is corporate formation problem number three. Now if you have yet to watch problem one, problem two, please do that before you do problem number three. Please stop the video and look at those problems before you do this one. So in this problem, we have two individuals, Strawberry and Raspberry. They plan to organize and form a corporation which we'll call Brilliant Berry Corporation. The corporation sells cookbooks that specialize in berry-based desserts. So you have strawberry shortcake, you have a blueberry crumble, you have all different types of berry desserts you can think of out there, but these, those are just some of the, the main ones. Strawberry and Raspberry each receive 10 shares of Brilliant Berry common stock in exchange for contributing the following assets. Now, I want to note that all amounts that I have here are at the date of contribution and all exchanges occur in the same day. So, Strawberry is going to get 10 out of 20 shares of common stock, so 50% of the ownership of the company. And in exchange, Strawberry is going to transfer to Brilliant Berry Corporation 10,000 cookbooks, which Strawberry held as inventory for six months. Now, at the date of contribution, the adjusted basis is $300,000 and the fair market value is $450,000. Raspberry also gets 10 out of 20 shares, so 50% of the corporation. Um, and in exchange, Raspberry is going to transfer to the corporation land, which um, was held as an investment for four years by Raspberry, has an adjusted basis of $260,000 and a fair market value of $350,000. Now, in addition to getting the common stock, Strawberry and Raspberry... Um, each have liabilities and Brilliant Berry is going to assume one of those liabilities. So um, Brilliant Berry takes on a liability, it assumes. Okay. Now there's no distinction here between uh, recourse and non-recourse. It doesn't make a difference with respect to this issue. Um, recourse being, you know, uh, someone is personally liable, non-recourse, no one's personally liable. Um, that's the idea there. Um, that makes no distinction here. So we're dealing with assumption here of liability. So Brilliant Berry is going to assume one liability from Strawberry and one liability from Raspberry. So the liability that Brilliant Berry assumes from Strawberry is $200,000 of debt that Strawberry used to purchase the, the uh, 10,000 cookbooks. And it's actually attached on the cookbooks through a perfected purchase money security interest. The debt that Raspberry owes that Brilliant Berry will assume is a $100,000 debt, which is unsecured. There's no property attached to it. And it was incurred four years ago to pay off Raspberry's gambling debt. So Ra Raspberry got into some rough times and, um, you know, was uh, was gambling and took out a loan because um, I guess Raspberry bet some money that Raspberry didn't have. And then the loan paid off um, that, that, that gambling. And then Raspberry still owes this money to a bank is $100,000. So um, Strawberry is giving property worth um, $450,000 to Brilliant to Berry, and Raspberry is giving something worth $350,000, and then Strawberry uh, has a liability relief of $200,000, and then Raspberry has a liability relief of $100,000. So if you actually look at it, in terms of the value of the corporation and whatnot, and what each is getting, they're each getting uh, they're each getting 50%, exactly 50%. Because the idea here is Strawberry is getting something worth $250,000 of value, and Raspberry is getting something here worth $250,000 of value. Because if you add up all of the uh, the fair market values of the assets, 450 plus 350, that's 800 minus the $200,000 and the $100,000 liability the corporation takes on. That means the, the corporation is getting $500,000 worth of value, right? The value here is $500,000. I'll go back over that when we look at um, the realized gain to each of the shareholders, $500,000. And each uh, shareholder gets 50% of the stock, so 50% of $500,000 is two fifty. dollars So Strawberry is getting something worth two fifty, dollars or giving up something worth two fifty dollars because Strawberry gives up um, property, but then has liability relief. So 450 minus 200,000 debt is 250. Raspberry gives up something worth 350, but gets 100,000 liability relief. So 350 minus 100 is 250. So boom, we're equal, and that's what we want to see because they're getting the same thing, and they should be getting the same thing, which they do. All right. So this is a corporate formation problem. Corporate formation or contribution. 
And whenever we have a corporate formation or contribution problem, we always have to go through our six steps that we've been dealing with. So the first step is always to determine the gain or loss recognized by the transferor shareholder. By the transferor shareholder. Which here we have two transferor shareholders. We have, potentially have to look at strawberry and raspberry. We have to look at both of those. Okay, so the second step is then after you do the first step to determine the adjusted basis of property received and stock received. Adjusted basis of stock and property received by those shareholders. And here, really the only property received by these shareholders is the uh, tw 10 shares of stock. Okay, the third item, the third step, is to determine the holding period of the stock. Because that can make a big difference because the stock to both of these shareholders is going to be held as a capital asset since they're not, uh, not dealers. And if they sell it later on, it's going to be a capital gain or capital loss, and we have to know whether it's long-term or short-term. So that's our first three steps of steps one through six. And remember that steps one through three deal with the transfer or shareholder, not the corporation, not the transferee corporation. So here we have to go through those steps, steps one, two, and three, with respect to both raspberry and strawberry. We have to look at both of those. Step four, we determine the gain or loss recognized by the corporation, which here is Brilliant Berry Corporation. That's the transferee shareholder. Once you determine that, step five is to determine the adjusted basis of all property received by the corporation, Brilliant Berry, which is going to be the cookbook and the land. The cookbook and the land. Finally, step six is the holding period on all of that property in step five. So the holding period of property received by the corporation. Because again, that can make a big difference for a corporation in determining whether it's long-term capital gain, short-term capital gain, 1231, and all that stuff. So that is for the transferee, steps four, five, and six, deal with the transferee corporation. So we always start with steps one, two, and three, because we always go in order, and we have to do that for each transfer shareholder, and then we do steps four, five, and six, because that's going to make things more efficient in determining these tax consequences. So we're going to start with step one to determine the recognized gain or loss. We're going to start with strawberries. We've got to go through step one, two, and three for each individual shareholder. We're working on strawberry first, and we're looking at step one, the recognized gain or loss. So what amount of recognized gain or loss does strawberry have? So if you remember, before we calculate the recognized gain or loss, we got to determine the section 1001 gateway, right? Our gateway provision, which is amount realized minus adjusted basis. And that gives us our realized gain or loss. And that's important because if the realized gain or loss is zero, the recognized gain or loss is going to be zero as well. Okay. Um, now, if we do have a realized gain or loss, it might not be recognized based on um, what we're going to continue with. Um, our first step in our checklist and look at section 351 because we're dealing with a corporate formation contribution. See if that applies. So we need to determine what is our amount realized here. So the amount realized, right, let's do this in a formula form, right? The amount realized is any cash received, any constructive cash received, any the fair market value of any non-cash property received, and then um, you subtract away uh, selling expenses. You subtract away selling expenses. All right. So we're looking at the value of the property that is um, uh, received, and then we're subtracting away the adjusted basis of that um, of the item given up. Right. And that's going to be subtract away the adjusted basis is the adjusted basis of property given up, which here is the cookbook, and that gives us the realized gain or loss. Gain if it's positive, loss if it's negative. So let's go ahead and determine our amount realized. So is strawberry receiving any actual cash? No. What about constructive cash? Yes. Strawberry owes a debt, and uh, Brilliant Berry Corporation is taking on that debt. 
So that's the first thing. We have $200,000 of debt that's relieved. That's a liability relief. So first thing in amount realized is the liability relief. Okay, no other liability relief for strawberry. What about the fair market value of non-cash property? Well, strawberry, strawberry receives 10 shares of Brilliant Berry Corporation common stock. So we have to determine the value of that common stock. The way we do that is we look at the assets minus the liabilities that are received as of the date everything is contributed. So there's two assets that Brilliant Berry Corporation gets on formation, the cookbooks and the land. So if we add those two together, 450 plus 350, the assets, 800,000. Minus how much liabilities is um, our uh, Brilliant Berry taking on? $200,000 debt from strawberry, $100,000 debt from raspberry. So that's $300,000 summed together, and that gives a value of the corporation of 500,000. Now each strawberry and raspberry are gonna get 50% of that, so 500,000 times 50%, that's 10 out of the 20 shares total, because each of them gets 10 shares, each shareholder. So that means the value of the 10 shares is $250,000. So strawberry gets liability relief of 200,000 plus 250,000 of non-cash property, the value of the stock, and there's no selling expenses, right? So that means that strawberry's amount realized is $450,000, $450,000. Minus the adjusted basis of property given up, which is simply the adjusted basis of the cookbooks, because that's the property given up. So minus $300,000, $300,000, and that gives strawberry a realized gain of 150,000. So that's the realized gain, 150,000. Now we have to determine how much of that $150,000 realized gain is recognized. Could be all of it, could be none of it, could be a portion of it. We gotta look at the specific details um, under section 351 and our step one of the checklist. All right, so we just determined that the realized gain for strawberry under step one, the realized gain is $150,000 under our section 1001 gateway provision. Now, applying our section 351 checklist, right, starting with step one, we have to start with step one, which is the main 351, that's 351A, 351A, that's step one. We gotta go through our checklist, which if you remember, there's a video that discusses the checklist, very important to look at, and there's really three things we gotta focus on, three requirements, and if we fail those three requirements, then we'll talk about what happens um, with that. Okay, so the first thing is, there must be a transfer of property to a corporation. So do we have property that is being transferred to a corporation? Well, Strawberry is transferring cookbooks, and there's also the liability relief. So these, the cookbooks are viewed as property, right? That, remember, property is very broadly defined. So there is property, and it's going to Brilliant Berry Corporation. The next thing is solely in exchange for stock in the corporation. Remember stock, well here we have plain vanilla common stock, so it's not an issue. Only if you have preferred stock or some type of hybrid do you have to worry about this. Solely in exchange is the key. Is strawberry only getting stock? Well actually no, because strawberry gets stock, but also gets liability relief, right? So the question becomes, is liability relief, does that trigger boot for question two? So we'll come back to that, right? That's a question. Whenever you have liability relief and you don't have any other boot, you should always put a question mark here. Let's go to question number, um, or requirement number three. And then immediately after exchange, so immediately, immediately after exchange, the transfer or transfer ors, shareholders, we'll put transfer ors, have control. Remember control is defined as 80% or more of all classes of stock and 80% or more of all voting classes of stock. Where there's only one uh, type of stock here, common stock, and strawberry and raspberry do this together, you look at before and after. Before the transaction, they had 0%, after they both have 100% together. So that has been met. They both meet that requirement number three immediately after exchange, they are in control together. So we go back to the solely in exchange. Now, if we fail requirement one or three, you don't get 351A or 351B, which is step two, right? You don't worry about, you don't even worry about 
no, number two. If you fail number one, number three, you're done. You can't get non-recognition. It all has to be recognized. So all $150,000 gain would be recognized if we fail question one or three. Well, question two, we're not sure about yet. We don't know whether we fail it. So we have to test it. The, the possibilities here is that if we do have liability relief, because that meets the requirement for boot. So the issue here is, is the liability relief boot? Is the liability relief boot? If it's boot, then it's a partial gain or loss recognition situation under step two. But if it's not boot, then you simply apply 351A, which is no gain or loss recognized. So that's what we're doing now. Okay, but that's kind of the framework. That's how this works. Now, when you're determining if liability relief is boot, you go to that second checklist, step uh, step one uh, um, of the checklist, part two, which goes into the boot issue. But within that, it also asks whether you actually have li um, whether the liability relief um, is boot. So there's two possibilities for being boot. So the first one is a liability that has a tax avoidance, or it's not business. It's not actually uh, for business purposes. Does not so liability is not not a bona fide business liability, and I'll put in parentheses for purposes of tax avoidance. So basically, this rule was put in to avoid some um, anti-abuse because at one time this specific item was not in here, and people were okay. Well, I'll just uh, you know um, have the uh, corporation take on take on my liability. That's not considered boot. That's the idea. So if it's not bona fide business liability and it's simply just used for tax avoidance or if it's personal in nature, then um, it is considered boot. The whole amount is considered boot. Just so you know. So here, Strawberry has a two hundred thousand dollar debt, which was used to purchase the cookbook. So that's a business reason, and it's actually a perfected purchase money security interest, which is attached on the property. Because it has that perfected purchase money security interest, it's automatically it meets this requirement. Um, it's, I mean that it is a business um, bona fide business liability. So this is not this is not the case. The liability is a bona fide business liability. Another way to test this is if it's um, been held, or, sorry, if it's longer than five years, five years or more, then it then it uh, it's considered a bona fide business liability. But the IRS can still scrutinize this. Um, and you'll see, um, we can talk about more, more of this later. The idea here is you don't, it shouldn't be a personal liability. It should actually be related to the item. So he, this, this liability by Strawberry was used to acquire the cookbooks, and it's actually attached to a perfected purchase money security interest on the cookbooks. This is pretty much a plain vanilla. This is as, as close as it gets to saying this is bona fide business liability. Okay, so we don't have that. The second possibility for liability relief is if the adjusted basis of the property Okay, I'm sorry, is if the liability itself, the liability itself, or the aggregate, if you have um, multiple bases, so I'll put aggregate in parentheses, A-G-G, -G, is greater than the adjusted basis of the aggregate assets. So here, the liability is $200,000, $200,000 of debt. The question is, is $200,000 greater than the $300,000 of the assets given up? And if there's multiple assets, you get to add them together. So if there's one liability, you have $200,000, but then you have to add the basis of all property together. And the answer here is $200,000 is not greater than $300,000. So therefore, this is not met either. So number two here is not met. Okay. So that means that this liability relief is not considered boot. So we do not have to apply 351B, we apply 351A, and that means that Strawberry has no gain recognized. None. No gain recognized. Now, I just want to talk about a few things about, the again, how this works. So, again, if you have liability relief and you meet requirements 1 and 3, you got to first, before you go into 351B, the boot rules, like we saw in previous problems, and apply those rules, you got to ask, is, it, is the liability relief boot? There's two possibilities for how it can be boot. If the liability is not a bona fide business liability, the full amount of the liability, all of it, is considered boot. If the liability in aggregate, or if you know you have multiple liabilities and they're greater than the aggregate adjusted basis, or if it's simply just one liability and one one um, asset, 
the liability is greater than the adjusted basis, then the excess, only the excess, I'll put that in parentheses, only the excess, and you'll see this in later problems, is boot. Only the excess for number two. So number one is all, all or nothing, but number two is only the excess. So I'm saying that if Strawberry had a $100,000 debt, you would take 300,000, it would be the difference, I'm sorry, if Strawberry had a, let's say, a um, $350,000 debt, it wouldn't be all 350 would be, um, would meet, would be all, it wouldn't be all of it, okay? It'd be 350 minus 300, 50,000. It'd be the excess. Now, if both of these apply, you do number one trumps number two, so all of it would be a um, would be a liability would uh, would be a um, boot. All would be a boot if both of these are met. All all of the liability is considered a boot, just so you know. If one and two is met, so that's how it works. So we actually, in this case, we meet all three requirements: one, two, and three, because we don't have any boot. The liability relief does not result in to the level of boot. We have property transferred, and immediately after exchange, the transferors. Um, have control. So Strawberry has no gain recognized with respect to this transaction. All right, so we've just determined that Strawberry has no gain or loss under step one. So let's go to step two and we're going to determine the adjusted basis of the stock, the 10 shares of stock in Brilliant Berry Corporation that Strawberry received as a result of this transaction. Okay, because Strawberry does not receive any boot, we just determined that right there's no boot there's no to determine the basis and so it's simply just determining the basis of the stock received okay so if you remember we have a formula and because section 351 applied right whether it's a or b it's still section 351 that applies we have to apply the basis rule remember every non recognition was as a respective basis rule which is section 358 so we go through our little formula which is under the internal revenue code in section 358 we start by carrying over, so we carry, we carry over the basis of transferred property, which here Strawberry is transferring the cookbook, cookbooks I should say, ten thousand cookbooks. So that's three hundred thousand dollars, which is the basis of the cookbooks being transferred. So that's our starting point. All right. We then subtract away any actual cash that Strawberry receives. Did Strawberry receive any actual cash? No. So actual cash is minus zero. So then we go to the next item. We subtract away any liability relief, constructive cash. Liability relief. Was there any liability relief to Strawberry here? You bet, right? The $200,000 of debt that was on the cookbooks, well, Brilliant Berry Corporation takes on that debt and Strawberry no longer owns it. The reason this is constructive is as it is because it's as if Brilliant Berry Corporation pays Strawberry $200,000 cash and then Strawberry turns around and uses $200,000 cash and pay it off. So it's as if Strawberry is receiving cash to pay off the debt. Even though indirectly that's not that's Brilliant Berry just really just is taking over the debt. That's really what's happening. So we subtract away the amount of the liability relief which is 200,000. So minus 200,000, we subtract away the fair market value of any non-cash property. The fair market value of non-cash property. So other property. Is there any other property here? No. We add to that the amount of any gain recognized. Is there any gain recognized? Well, in step one, there was zero gain or loss recognized. So it's minus zero for fair market value plus zero. So that means the basis of this um, of the um, the 10 shares of stock received by Strawberry, if we put this all together, the adjusted basis of the stock received in total is one hundred thousand dollars. One hundred thousand dollars. So that means it's um, ten thousand dollars per share because there's ten shares. Right? If you calculate it it's so 100,000 divided by 10, which is uh, $10,000 per share. So that's the adjusted basis of the stock in total, $100,000. That's step two for Strawberry. Now we determine step three for Strawberry, which is the holding period of the 10 shares. 
the holding period of the 10 shares of uh, Brilliant Berry Corporation common stock. So the holding period of the stock because Strawberry holds this as a capital asset. So it really makes a difference if Strawberry sells it the next day because it'll be long, it'll be short term capital gain versus long term capital gain depending on how long it's held, whether it tax, all those different things. Okay, those types of issues. Remember that with tacking, if it's a Section 1231 asset or a capital asset, then it tax. But if it's not a 1231 asset, if it's not the above, or it's cash because cash has no holding period, then it's a fresh start. Fresh start means that the clock starts running as of the day that this exchange takes place. So here, Strawberry is, if we look at the property that's being transferred to the corporation. Here, Strawberry is transferring cookbooks, which were held as inventory. Inventory is not a 1231 asset or a capital asset under those definitions. So therefore, it's a fresh start. So that means that all 100% of each share, because remember, it's based on a percentage of each of the share, is fresh start, FS for fresh start, fresh start. So we've gone through steps one, two, and three for strawberry. Now it's time to go through steps one, two, and three for raspberry. So the first step for Raspberry is to determine the recognized gain or loss on this transaction. And remember, again, whenever you're doing recognized gain or loss and you have a property transaction, you always have to start with the section 1001 gateway provision, which you should know by heart now, amount realized minus adjusted basis equals the realized gain or loss. So here, in formula format, we have the amount realized, which remember is the amount of actual cash received plus the liability relief plus the fair market value of non-cash property received minus any selling expenses. And we subtract away the adjusted basis of the property given up, and that gives us the realized gain if it's positive the realized loss if it's negative. And remember, that's not what goes in the tax return. The recognized gain or loss is what goes in the tax return. Actually gets reported. All right. So the amount realized here, did Raspberry receive any actual cash? No. What about constructive cash? Did Brilliant Berry take on any of Raspberry's liabilities? Yes. $100,000 debt that was unsecured and incurred four years ago pay off Raspberry's gambling debt. Brilliant Berry takes that on. So... Raspberry's amount realized starts with $100,000 for liability relief plus what non, what non-cash property did Raspberry receive here? 10 shares of Brilliant Berry Corporation common stock, which remember we've already valued earlier at $250,000, right? The value of the corporation is 500,000 assets minus liabilities times 50% because Raspberry gets 10 over 20, which is 250,000, right? 500,000 times 50%, 250,000. So 100,000 plus 250,000. And then is there any selling expenses? No. So the amount realized here is $350,000 minus the adjusted basis of the property given up, which is the land has a basis of $260,000. That gives a realized gain because it's going to be positive of 90,000. So the realized gain to raspberry is 90,000. So now we have to determine whether that $90,000 realized gain will be recognized, if it will be zero recognized, all of it recognized, a portion, or whatnot. So we just determined that the realized gain for Raspberry is 90,000. And now we need to determine how much of that $90,000 realized gain will be recognized, if any. So since this is a corporate formation or contribution, well, this is formation. We go through our six steps and we start with our step one, which is section 351A, which this is part one, right? Part one is 351A portion. So remember that there's three elements that have to be met in order to get non-recognition under section 351A. The first is that there must be property transferred to a corporation. So here we look at the property being transferred, which Raspberry is transferring land. 
Is land property? Yes. Land is very broadly defined. That is land. Um, I'm sorry, that is property. Is it going to a corporation? Yes. Brilliant Berry is a corporation. So requirement one is met. The second requirement is that it must be solely in exchange for stock in the corporation. In the corporation. In Brilliant Berry Corporation. So the key here is solely in exchange. Well, Bril well, Raspberry is receiving shares of stock, but Raspberry also receives liability relief. And remember, whenever there's liability relief, you got to put a question mark here. Now, if there was boot, let's say um, Raspberry got uh, stock, cash, and um, liability relief, it would automatically be, um, no, this is not solely in exchange. But whenever there's liability relief, you got to do a, uh, a, a special test. You got to do a special test, which is in part two of my checklist about whether liability relief, whether it's boot. Does it meet the level of boot? So we have to figure out that. But before we do that, um, you wouldn't do that if you fail requirement number three. If you fail requirement one or three, you don't even do that because you don't get any non-recognition treatment. So we got to go to requirement three and make sure that's met. So require, requirement three, which we already saw this under strawberry because we had to do this discussion um, since it's a transferor group, immediately after the exchange, the transferors, which here are raspberry and strawberry together, they have control. And they're together because they're doing this as part of a plan to form a corporation, and it's all simultaneous, right? Talking about the intermountain lumber issue, that part of that binding agreement, um, you know, that pre- that, 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 that agreement whether you know you're gonna go together and there's also that time element um, that's there so remember that control is 80% or more of all classes of stock and then um, also 80% or more of all voting classes of stock and the way that I always do this is I go through the um, through the before and after test before strawberry and raspberry together own 0% after this transaction Ra Ra strawberry and raspberry, they own um, 100%. So we do have control by raspberry. So therefore, since we meet requirements one and three, but we're not sure about requirement two, we go to part two of the 351 um, of, the, of the step one checklist, which we have to determine, is, it li is this liability relief boot? So if you recall from our previous discussion with um, strawberry, this will be boot if it's one of two different possibilities. The first one is that it's a non bona fide business debt. Non bona fide business debt. And you do have to look at the facts and circumstances, but the idea here is this was put in place as a tax avoidance mechanism. Now it doesn't have to be a for sure tax avoidance um, you know, type situation because if you look at the facts and circumstances, it can be pretty obvious. So here, Raspberry doesn't have any secure it's not secured on anything so that's working in raspberry's um not in raspberry's favor favor um uh it's also incurred four years ago so it's within five years and look at this it was used for gambling which is personal so while strawberry's debt we saw earlier is a perfect example of a bona fide business debt raspberry is on the opposite end of the spectrum this is an example of a a perfect example of a non bona fide business debt where you have gambling, it's within uh, five years when it was incurred because that, that kind of uh, lends to tax avoidance because maybe you took it out immediately before the transaction. Again, I talked talk, I talked about how this is put in place um, to stop, uh, you know, um, tax abuse, you know, various abuses, anti-abuse provision. And then also it's unsecured in any property dealing with the business. So this is a non bona fide business debt. And we can actually stop here. The other one is the excess rule, right? Where the um, you use the excess, where the um, the liability is greater than the adjusted basis, the aggregate of the items, right? So you look at the liability is 100. Is that greater than the adjusted basis? No, but it doesn't matter because if you have requirement number, if you have the first liability, the non bona fide uh, business debt, if that is met, which that's the case here, all all liability, the full amount of the liability is boot. So $100,000 liability which is all of it equals boot it's all boot so then once we determine that hundred thousand dollar liability is boot now 
we say that we, okay, we fail, we fail requirement number two. And remember from our previous problems, we saw that if we fail requirement number two, but we meet requirement one and three, we can still get treatment under section 351B, which is a partial non-recognition rule, which is what we have here. So section 351B says that if you have boot, which we do, we have $100,000 of liability relief, the amount of the gain recognized is the lesser of the realized gain, which here is 90,000, or the amount of the boot, which is 100,000. But remember, you can never uh, recognize loss with 351B, right, or 351A. So basically, you can never have a loss recognition under Section 351. So what is lesser, the realized gain of 90,000 or the $100,000 boot? Well, it's the 90,000. So that means under Section 351B, $90,000, which is the realized gain, is recognized because it's lesser, right? It's the lesser of the $90,000 realized gain or the $100,000 boot. $90,000 is, in fact, recognized because it's the lesser number. So that, that answers the question, how much, step one, how much gain must be recognized? $90,000 must be recognized under Section 351B. All right, so let's go on to step two, and we're going to determine the adjusted basis of the 10 shares of common stock in Brilliant Berry Corporation. So the adjusted basis of the stock that Raspberry receives, that's step two. Remember that because Section 351B applied, right, 351A or 351B, if either of them apply, then Section 358 sets the formula, the adjusted basis rule, right? Every non-recognition rule, there is a corresponding adjusted basis rule to defer the gain or loss that is not recognized. That's the idea. So this is Section 358. We start by carrying over the basis of the property that was um, that was transferred by the transfer shareholder. So we carry over the adjusted basis of the property transferred, which here, Raspberry transfers some land, which was held as investment, which has an adjusted basis of 260000 Then we subtract away any actual cash received. So we subtract away any actual cash. Did Raspberry receive any actual cash here? No. There's no actual cash received, so it's going to be minus zero. What about constructive cash, which is liability relief? Did Raspberry receive any liability relief? Yes. Here, there was $100,000 of debt that Raspberry owed on a gambling debt, and um, Brilliant Berry Corporation took on that debt. So that's minus $100,000 of liability relief, minus the fair market value of any non-cash property received, so that'd be boot, any, not, any boot received, um, any boot other than cash or liability relief, right? of a non-cash property received, so fair market value of non-cash property received, and that is zero because um, Raspberry did not receive any uh, non-cash property. They did. Raspberry did have liability relief, which we just subtracted away, uh, but no actual cash and no non-cash uh, property received. And then we add to that any gain recognized, which was in step one. So how much gain was recognized by Raspberry in step one, 90,000, which remember was the lesser of the 90,000 realized gain or the $100,000 of liability relief boot. So we net these numbers together, 260 minus 100,000, that's 160,000, plus 90,000, that's 250,000. That is the adjusted basis of the 10 shares of stock received by Raspberry from Brilliant Berry. So if you divide that 250,000 by 10 shares, that's 25,000 per share if you're calculating it per share. But if you're doing a total number, it's 250,000 uh, is the amount total for those 10 shares. So step three for Raspberry, we're determining the holding period of the 10 shares of Brilliant Berry common stock that Raspberry has received. So remember that when we deal with holding period and tacking, determine whether it tax or not, we look at the property that Raspberry or the shareholder transferred, and if it's a capital asset, 
or a section 1231 asset, it will tack. If it's not a capital asset or a section 1231 asset, or it's cash, because cash does not have a holding period, it's considered that portion of the shares using relative fair market value, if you have multiple assets, right, that qualify um, for different things, is a fresh start. So here, we look at what Raspberry has transferred. Raspberry has transferred land, and it was held as an investment. So you look at how it was held. And because the land was held as an investment, that's a capital asset. So that means that, since that's, since that's the only asset that was transferred to the corporation, that means that all of the shares 100% tax. 100% tax of each share tax. So that means that they automatically are long term because it's greater than one year, right? It's been four years and that gets added on. We've gone through steps one, two, and three for both of our transferor shareholders, strawberry and raspberry. So now we focus our attention on steps four, five, and six, which should be pretty simple. Again, if you go in order, it really does help things. So we're looking at brilliant. Barry Corporation, again, the transferee corporation here. And again, you always want to go in order because it makes things a lot easier. So step four, we're determining the recognized gain or loss to the transferee corporation. And just like our usual result under section 1032, which is very broad language, there's no gain or loss recognized to the corporation. Only in extreme circumstances will there be gain or loss recognized um, with respect to a contribution by uh, various shareholders. And this is a contribution, it's a formation, but it's also considered a contribution. So that's the answer there, is that no gain or loss is recognized by Brilliant Berry Corporation with respect to these consequences. So then we go to step five, and we determine the adjusted basis of property received by, by Brilliant Berry. And we really just have two pieces of property. The loans themselves, they they have a face value that Brilliant Berry has to make, you know, that Brilliant Berry has in, in uh, paying them off. But we're looking at the assets here, the adjusted basis of the property receipt. So we have the uh, cookbooks and we have the land. Now remember that section 362 is the corresponding basis rule that applies when section 1032 applies to the transferee corporation. So because section 1032 applied, section 362 comes in and it has a uh, formula. It's a very basic formula. And the formula is we start with the carryover basis of what the transferor shareholder had. So you basically look at the basis that was brought in by, at the date of contribution. So for the cookbooks, we have 300,000 as the adjusted basis. And then for the land, it's 260000 And then we add any gain recognized by the transfer or shareholder. So we look at the, the cookbooks are corresponding to strawberry. Did strawberry recognize any gain? We'll look back at step one for strawberry. And the answer is no. For the land, that corresponds to raspberry. And since raspberry only has one asset, you don't have to break it up, which makes things you know, you have mixed uh, a mixed bag of, of issues to deal with. But since there's only one piece of property, all the gain that Raspberry recognized in step one all goes to the land, which is 90,000. Remember, 90,000 was recognized, the lesser of the um, 90,000 realized gain and the amount of boot. So the adjusted basis of the pieces of property, the cookbooks are going to have a total basis of 300,000, and the land is going to have a total basis of the fair market value, which is 350,000. 350,000. That makes sense because all of that was recognized. Okay? So, corporation takes a basis of 300,000 in cookbooks, 350 in the land. Finally, step six, we determine the holding period of these pieces of property because if they're capital, then you have to determine if they're cap uh, long term, short term, or whatnot. We look at the holding period and remember that for the corporation, everything tax. All tax, all they all tax. So you get to add on those that six months. So if the cookbooks, they're likely going to be well, they are going to be inventory to the corporation. But if they weren't, you would get to put on that six months that was held, even though it was held as inventory by Strawberry. And then the four years, 
um, that gets added on. So the cookbook's coming in with six months and the land comes in with four years. So I hope this has helped you with the analysis.